readings from, but we've had to do them up there because the camera's been right here. But if you look, we have a camera back there now, so I can come down here and be with you guys, so uh, if you don't mind too much. Uh, all of my diseases are in remission, it's good. And I'm looking out, there's so much to celebrate today, and I'm looking right here at Jim Stewart, and I'm going, okay, this is really terrific, because it's not Easter, and Jim Stewart's here, and it means either that he's feeling really well or the golf courses are closed. Which is it? Ah. Thank you, God. I appreciate you doing that. You know. So, welcome, welcome, welcome. He is risen. He's risen indeed. He's been risen for a week. He's risen indeed. Welcome. We're continuing to celebrate that. Today is the uh, first Sunday in Eastertide. So here's the quiz for the day. How long is Eastertide? That was a good guess. 40 is a good guess, but it's not correct. Eastertide. So... Um, this is what Google will do for you. This is not my seminary education. This is, uh, this is Google. But um, now here's something I learned this morning. And I'm going to, this is a stump the stars kind of thing. Do you know what today is called in the traditional liturgical church celebration? What, the, what this week actually that we've just gotten through. Do you know what it's called? Nobody? No Catholics. No, no recovering Catholics here, obviously. It's called the octave of Easter. It marks eight days, including Easter Sunday and this Sunday, hence octave. So this very first week of Easter tide is called the octave of Easter. So we are here celebrating the octave of Easter today, whether you knew it or not. So feel good about that. And those of you that can sing and know about octaves, you can break into song anytime. Uh, let's see, what else do I want to tell you? All right, this morning... Our, we talk about the themes usually up in here, and I want, to, I want to say that we're going to look and we're going to ask ourselves a question. Why Galilee? Why Galilee? If you recall your um, resurrection scriptures, Jesus tells the disciples to meet him in Galilee. It's an interesting question, I think. And so we're going to poke at that today and find out, find out why. We're going to take a look at that. So that's what we're doing. Uh, let's see. And then we have a, another special celebration. I saved this uh, for last because it's really cool. These flowers right here are here today, and they have uh, been a gift of Gary and Barbara Okeson in celebration of their 60th anniversary. So let's give them a round, even though they're not here. So we thank Gary and Barbara for brightening our sanctuary this way, and we thank them for having uh, anniversaries, and we pray them many, many more. So, so that's, uh, that's uh, everything we need to look at before we get started to worship. So let's, uh, without further ado, prepare our hearts and our minds to worship God. Good morning on this uh, octave.
Take heart, Jesus will not let us fail. What God asks of us, we can do. Let us worship our risen Lord. Please stand, if able, and join in the hymn of praise, God of Wonders. I invite you to join me now in this prayer for the East. God is doing something new, and it is us. Into the glorious future of God's reign, our Lord Jesus leads us. We follow Christ into God's new world. Bless God who has blessed us. We praise God for we have received grace in Christ Jesus. Bless God who is called daughters and sons of the Most High. We praise God for adopting us in the Holy Family. Bless God giving us an inheritance. Bless God who calls us to grow into the likeness of Jesus. We praise God who gives us the Spirit, who brings us to full maturity in Christ. Amen. Amen. Listen to the word of God.
Now listen to the word of And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord, descending from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. For he has been raised, and as he said, come see the place where he lay, then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has been raised from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee, there you will see him. This is my message to you. So they left the tomb quickly, with fear and great joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. that first Sunday after Easter, and I've been reflecting on the whole kind of series of events that lead up to and, and constitute Easter. I'm sure you have as well. Many of us walked together on that Lenten journey and prepared ourselves. And One thing that really stands out for me is, is, is when we get to the Advent celebration, when we get to what you and I would call Christmas, right? There is a lot going on. There's stars shining, there's shepherds coming, there's angels flying, there's people proclaiming. There's all this stuff going on around this miracle birth, right? What goes on around Jesus' resurrection? Nothing. Nothing. All four Gospels confirm the empty tomb, but they offer no witnesses to the actual resurrection itself. Don't you find that fascinating? This incredible miracle that's never happened in the world before. A man is raised from the dead and there's nobody there to see it, to proclaim it, to applaud it, to do anything. It happens in the will of God in absolute silence. I think that's amazing. This miracle is achieved without any fanfare. It's only after the fact that we begin to see what occurred and try to imagine what that might mean for us. But if Christ rises from the grave with little ado, it promptly leaves no doubt that there's much to do. The risen Christ speaks a straightforward yet demanding agenda, and he gives it to the women to give to his disciples. Don't cling to me. Do not be afraid. Go, tell, baptize, teach, feed, and ultimately tend. That's the to-do list for the disciples. By the way, that's our to-do list as well, right? But he tells them to do something else. He tells them to do something first. Did you catch it? Did you catch it? Do you remember what it is? Matthew, Mark, and Luke all agree that he tells them to go to Galilee where he'd meet. A mountain in Galilee where he'd meet. Now John doesn't report this instruction. 
But he simply shows Jesus meeting the disciples at that lakeside. So clearly all four Gospels are confirming this trip to Galilee that Jesus puts the disciples on following the resurrection. So what's the big deal about Galilee? Why Galilee? I think that's an interesting question, and I want to poke at that today. Here's a map, obviously. And this is, that's Israel. You see the Great Sea, that's the Mediterranean there. You can see that, you see the two big yellow arrows that we put in there? The lower one down in that kind of magenta quadrant down there, that lower one is pointing at Jerusalem. That's where Jesus is, right? That's where he's been executed. That's where the empty tomb is, down there in the southern portion of Israel. That upper arrow, arrow points to Galilee, the northern section of Israel. Israel, where Jesus, by the way, conducted the majority of his ministry. And it's about 80, 90 miles from one of those arrows to the other. The whole, the whole of Israel is just a little over 100. So Jesus is down here at the lower arrow, and he tells Mary and the women to tell the disciples to go to Galilee. And so off they go. Off they go. But why, then, is it so important to go there now? I think that's something else that's interesting to poke at. Why not just stay in Jerusalem? Right? Use your strategic sense. Jerusalem is the biggest city in Israel, right? There's people everywhere. There are all sorts of opportunities in Jerusalem to spread the word, and they're already there. So why would you go 80 miles or so up into this province when you've got a fertile ministry area right here before you? I think that's a, just a phenomenal kind of thing, something to scratch your head about. None of the current evangelists in our culture would do that. They'd all stay in Jerusalem, trust me. Now, this is kind of confusing, I think, because earlier... Jesus had been in Galilee. If you remember our Lenten journey, right, we started in Caesarea Philippi, which is above that upper arrow. So Jesus is up there in Caesarea Philippi, and you go to, say, Mark's 8th chapter, and he asks those disciples that telling question, who do the people say that I am? And then he turns and he says, who do you say that I am? And then Peter famously proclaims him as the Messiah, the son of the living God. And bang, he turns on his heel and heads directly south. Been before where he's telling them to go now. I think that's confusing. And not only had he been there, but when he heads to Jerusalem, and we talked about this during Lent, he's so intent on getting there. I love Luke's uh, comment. Luke says he set his face to go to Jerusalem. So for some reason, which we learn to understand, Jesus leaves Galilee, goes to Jerusalem, gets himself killed. That's all pretty clear. But the question that remains for you and me is, so why are we going to leave there now? Now, the Mark text shows the determination, Jesus' determination, to face his future. And you heard that read this morning. Unchar and uncharacteristically, uncharacteristically, all three of the synopt synoptics are in agreement that he's going to go to Jerusalem, right? Uncharacteristically, Jesus leads the band. That's a fairly accurate picture there. Jesus is the first in the line. Generally speaking, the rabbi would be in the middle so that everybody could hear him because he's teaching as he walks. That's the way it worked. But in this place, the text is really clear that Jesus walks ahead of his frightened disciples and he turns and he tells them what's about to happen. He says, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be handed over to the chief priests. I'm going to be condemned, mocked, spit upon, flogged, and killed. And after three days, I'll rise again. So all that occurs on that southern journey, right? Jerusalem is the center of life in Israel, you see. It's where all roads meet if you're in Israel. So it makes sense that he would leave this northern province and come down to Jerusalem for the execution. And then and now, Jerusalem is a cosmopolis. It's full of different cultures, full of people for starters, but it's full of different cultures, different ways, different religions. 
It's very, very cosmopolitan. The ancient streets are packed shoulder to shoulder. They were then, and they are now. There may have been as many as a million people in Jerusalem when Jesus went there for the Passover, which led to his death. Folks are shoulder to shoulder. They're scurrying. They're anxious. There's a multiplicity of humanity in Jerusalem. I'll show you, just give you some examples. This is from a trip I took to Jerusalem uh, four or five years ago, the first time that I went. This is the view of Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, from the site where Jesus historically wept over Jerusalem. We were standing in exactly that spot. So you're looking at Jerusalem here. There's the Temple of the Rock right there. I think I'm ahead of myself. I missed the map. Do we have a map? Thank you. I'm not doing very well here today. This is Easter enthusiasm has me. Let's, let's go back to this. Here's Jerusalem itself, right? The lower two-thirds of that map is, is old Jerusalem. That upper left-hand corner is new Jerusalem. But the real old, old, old Jerusalem is in this upper right-hand corner. I don't know if you can read that, but it says the city of David. That's the original Jerusalem there. And then all that other stuff that looks to be kind of ochre or kind of rusty colored, that all grew around it. That big thing in the middle, that's the Temple Mount. That's the Temple Mount. In 34 BC, Herod the Great began to rebuild the temple that had been torn down there. And it took 60 years to get it built, and it was the most magnificent structure of its day. So that's the Jerusalem that Jesus goes to. Very urban, very cosmopolitan, packed, right? So now, let's, let's move forward again. So let's go. We know about him going to Jerusalem. We know about the flogging and all that stuff. Well, here we find ourselves in Jerusalem, and I explained that to you. That's the, that's the Dome of the Rock, which is on that Temple Mount. That's what you're seeing. This is, uh, there's just a few slides here. There's eight of them, I think, that just kind of illustrate what goes on. This is a street sign in the old city of Jerusalem. And the top line, you'll see that there's three lines in each of those directions, right? The top line is in Hebrew. The middle line, this is how cosmopolitan the town is. The middle line is in Arabic, and the lower line is in English. And virtually all the signs there are this way because that's the population that's there. Let's look at the next one. This is, this is a bazaar, also called a souk. Um, and this shows you how crowded and narrow and everything it is. These, these little, there's all these little stores off to the side in this kind of alleyway that goes down the middle. And the old city of Jerusalem is full of these things. And you can buy all kinds of stuff there. You can see there's fruit over here on the right. There's clothing on the left. There's all sorts of trinkets and souvenirs and all that stuff. This is Jerusalem. This is the old city. Let's go to the next one. This is one of two sites proposed for where Jesus is buried. This one was under construction when we were there. That's why you see all the shoring and stuff there. But you can see how many people line up to go visit the proposed grave of Jesus. There were so many people there that when we were there, we didn't even bother to stand in line. We said, who, who wants to do that? We'll go elsewhere. What's next? Oh, this is, a, this is an interesting place. This is a, a prayer citadel that sits at the top, it sits within the cathedral that's built over Golgotha, where the cross was. And this is the last place you go before you go to see the site where the cross supposedly was. You can see all the glitz and all that kind of stuff. Um, very, very ornate. A lot of ritual goes on there. What's next? The Wailing Wall, right? Famous Wailing Wall, west wall of the, of the Temple Mount. Um, that's, where, that's where we are there. You can see that these guys are gathered and they're praying. Over to the right is where the women would gather because they, they don't mix. What's next? This is, uh, I've forgotten exactly which cathedral this is. I think this is the one with the humble gate. It has two gates, one that's normal size and then one that's about mm, four and a half feet tall that if, you really have, if the Spirit's really moving you, you go through this. It's called the humble gate because you have to bend over to get into this cathedral where Jesus was, is supposedly the site of Jesus' birth. Last one for this series. This is the other, the alternative site um, for Jesus' burial. This is in the garden. This is called the garden tomb. And this is in a really beautiful setting, surrounded by trees and flowers and fountains and things. And that's a cave, and you can go in there. You can see these folks are waiting to go in. That's their, that's their guide right there. 
But that gives you some idea about how Jerusalem is, at least how it is now. So as I said, it's very cosmopolitan, very urban, very busy. Things move fast in Jerusalem. They did in Jesus' day, and they do now. Think about New York or maybe L.A. or Chicago, that kind of fast, urban fast, right? Tension, pressure, people moving everywhere. Pay attention. Hang on to your wallet. For Jesus, Jerusalem is a killing ground, literally and figuratively. The hustle and the bustle kill the soul, and the power brokers kill the body. That's what goes on in Jerusalem. In the twisting, teeming streets of the city, confusion reigns. In Jesus' time, Palm Sunday adorers turned into Good Friday executioners. It's easy to lose your bearings in Jerusalem. This is the temptation gallery. I had my picture taken there because if if anybody really deserves to be outlining temptations, it would be me. (laughs) Easy to lose your bearings in Jerusalem. Perhaps Jesus has all this in mind when he tells the women Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. There they will see me. I think he's hinting at the fact that it's almost impossible to see him in Jerusalem because it is so full of people, so full of activity, so full of events. Jerusalem is wearisome. When I went, both times that I went, we started out in Jerusalem and we moved up to Galilee and I was never so glad to get in a bus and get on the road because I, just, I had had more people than I could take, more sights than I could see. I was ready to go. Jesus says, there they'll see me. Galilee, you see, is as remote from Jerusalem spiritually as it is geographically. It's rural. It's bucolic. It's a land of tranquil grace and beauty. Very agrarian. And, of course, there is the lake up there. This is the road to Galilee coming out of Jerusalem, heading north. This is the road. You can see the countryside is changing from desert into kind of uh, rural uh, greenery and all that sort of stuff. Let's look at the next one. This is Jesus, that guy on the right, that's Jesus down on the knees is Peter. This is Jesus rehabilitating Peter by the side of of the lake. Beautiful, beautiful spot. This is one of two sites proposed Uh, for the Sermon on the Mount. And this is seen from up in the top of the hill, and it rolls down and goes toward the lake. This is the Garden of the Beatitudes. This is a beautiful, beautiful place. Each Beatitude is is on a a small stone pedestal there, and and there are benches near them, and you can wander through this garden as long as you want, and you can stop by each Beatitude, and you can sit on the bench, and you can pray or think or do whatever you want to do. But you can see how different this is than Jerusalem. You can see how peaceful this is. This is a view from the top of the mountain right there by the garden, looking down toward the lake, looking across the lake to the Golan Heights over there. That's what you see off in the distance. This is an interesting spot. This is uh, when you go, generally they'll take you out on a boat, a fishing boat that is supposedly like the ones that uh, Jesus would, would have known. That little cleft in the mountains right there, that's a break. Those mountains go all the way down the side of the lake, except for here. And they theorize, they don't theorize, this is what happens. The Mediterranean is, if, if you would, the Mediterranean is out through that cleft and then down to the left. And they say that the winds build over the Mediterraneans and they come up and they work the backside of that mountain trying to get this way, trying to come to you until they hit this hole. And then they get funneled through this hole. And it's really quite violent. And that's where the storms hit the lake. When we hear the stories about Jesus in the boat on the storms, walking on the water in the storms, they claim that this is the sort of geological construct that gives rise to those storms. And the Sea of Galilee is really shallow. So when this wind comes funneling through there and hits that sea, it really makes a mess. What do, we, do we have more? I don't remember. Oh, that's next. That, just leave that there. That's fine. So that's what Galilee looks like. You can see the difference. You can sense the difference. It's, it's just really a whole nother experience from Jerusalem. 
Galilee is where Jesus taught, where he healed, where he performed miracles. It was his place of choice for trying to send his message. It's home to Capernaum, home to the Sea of Galilee. You've seen that. It's where he shared the Sermon on the Mount. You saw that site. It's where he fed 5,000. It's where he walked on the water. As I said, he spent most of his ministry here. Things move much more slowly in Galilee. It's a very different experience than urban Jerusalem. It's a place where it's easy to hear the Holy Spirit speaking across the sun-dappled hills and the moonlit waters. Believe me. Which takes me to this next slide. There's the moonlit waters. We were staying in a place called the Ron Beach Hotel, right on the shore of the lake. And we had dinner, and a group of us gathered out on a patio one night, and that moon was just up there, just like you see it. And we had a couple of glasses of wine. And everybody else adjourned, went to their rooms. And I was just captivated by this moon coming across the water and the tranquil water and the beauty of the, of the light. And if you look down kind of right lower center, there's a dock down there, a small boat dock. And I just walked down that ladder that you see, and I went out to the end of that dock, and I took my shoes off, put my feet in the water, and I sat there for probably an hour just awestruck by the moon and overwhelmed by the spiritual experience of the peace of this moment. You see, I lost all of that when I was in Jerusalem. There's a, I was always bumping shoulders with somebody, and they were always pushing me into somewhere else, and it was, it just, you, it's hard to find Jesus in Jerusalem, believe it or not, but it's easy to find Jesus up here. I sat on that dock for probably an hour, and I prayed and I reflected and I felt the presence of the Spirit of God. And I was blessed. I was blessed. I want to share a poem with you by a woman named Sarah Arthur. Some of you will be familiar with her. She does devotional materials. And she reflects a bit on this. So, This is called, You Gave Up All This, Part 1. I sit at the window by the light of the moon. Not a mysterious moon tonight, but a frankly honest sister. All children are in bed except myself, wide awake blinking at my sister moon and wandering in the still night air. Lord, when I remember that you gave up your life, I rarely remember this is what you gave up. Too often I think of the diseased crowds pressing close around you waiting for disaster. This sick life I always think of. And it seems not such a big loss. But of course you gave up your life purpose in a way which was to bring good news to the poor to put out your hand and restore sight to a blind man, to lift the evil spirit from a boy writhing on the ground at your feet. You gave that up too. But you also gave up nighttime and this very same moon reflecting on the calm waters of Galilee. And I wonder how could you bear it? How could I? So asked Sir Arthur. So Galilee if I presented it properly, is a place of peace. It's a place of deep spirituality. It's a place where you can find Jesus, and he's readily available. Now, the risen Christ offers peace, and he offers it there in Galilee. But he hasn't overlooked that agenda that he put out there first. He knows his disciples are suffering from something like PTSD and they're muddling toward the future through shock and confusion and grief and everything that attends his loss, right? So he brings them to quiet Galilee to regain focus, free from the pressures and the distractions of the big city. And he knows that they're going to need that peace that passes all understanding to teach and to baptize, to go and to tell and to feed and to tend. Now I tell you all this, this morning, because we need to take a lesson here. On this Sunday after Easter, on this octave Sunday as it's called, we need to take a lesson. Like the 11, we modern post-Easter disciples need to get out of killer Jerusalem and refresh our souls in Galilee that we might hear Christ calling more clearly. We need to slow down. We need to quiet down. We need to reflect. We need to quiet the babble that's all around us 
to withdraw, to go offline, to create opportunities to join those who have seen the risen Savior. We come out of the busyness of this season. Yes, 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 we have Lent and we have everything that accompanies that and, and works on our souls, but we also have the joy and the busyness of Easter and friends and family and everything else that attends it. We need to put that down. We need to open ourselves to that risen Savior who gave his life that we might do that. Among Christ's last words were these. Remember, he says to you and he says to me, I am with you always to the end of the age. That's his promise. So the question I want to ask briefly here today before I close is, have you worked to create some sort of spiritual space sufficient to accommodate Jesus' presence within you? Have you paid attention to that quiet voice calling into your soul, saying, I want time with you? Where is your Galilee? Where can you find the space for this sort of thing? An hour a week in worship is a great start, really is, but it isn't adequate to the task. What about private time in the word and prayer? Have you done that? Have you made space for that? Have you scheduled a meeting with the Holy Spirit? What about fasting from whatever most distracts you from your faith? Have you done that? What about joining a serious Bible study? There's an opportunity. We have them here. We start up again on Wednesday with our David Bible study, by the way. What about joining an accountability group? Sharing with another person or two the troubles of your journey and the joys that you find. What about covenanting with another disciple to share a time each week together in Scripture? I have a really good friend who meets with one other guy. He's been doing it for probably 15 years. And they're reading their way through the New, Temp New Testament in Greek. And they meet every two weeks. And they take a certain three or four or five passages. And they read them in Greek and they memorize them and they share them. And they're taking the gospel in really deeply in this way. What about something like that? What about investing a few solitary days somewhere on a personal retreat? Spirit of the Desert's just out north of us here. Great place to go get away. What about just stopping by the Franciscan Renewal Center down there on Lincoln for a couple of hours every so often and go wandering in the fields out around there? They have a couple of little chapels that are really, really gracious. These are all ways of going to Galilee in our day, in our place, in our age. These are all ways of preparing to respond to Christ's calling. 2,000 years later, there remains so much to be done. So many people to touch with spike-scarred hands. We know that. That's our burden, and that's our opportunity. The risen Christ instructs you, and he instructs me as he did the women at the tomb. Don't cling to me. Do not be afraid. Go, tell, baptize, teach, feed, tend. That's what he wants from us. He wants us to share him. He wants us to share his ministry. We, each of us, need to answer in whatever awestruck and mumbling way we can. But before we do, we need to go meet him in Galilee and prepare ourselves. Amen. Let us stand now, if we're comfortably able, and let's share together this hymn, Open the Eyes of My Heart, and pray that he does.
Please be seated. So now we arrive at that time that we've been calling responding in commitment, the time that was traditionally when we would have our offering. And we've talked about that. We talk about it every week. You know how, how we're doing this. And so there is an opportunity to give an offering out there in the narthex. There are some boxes out there for you. You can uh, clearly do that online. You can send a check in. You know all the ways to do that now. And you've been gracious to continue to do that and to support us. So I'm going to go right on by that. And I'm going to explain once again that this responding in commitment, the idea here is you've heard up here of Jesus' commitment to you. You've heard what he's done for you. And now is your time to reflect and go, what shall I do for him? If I go to Galilee, what will I learn? What will he want from me? And he's given you his agenda. You heard it this morning. So reflect on that, if you will, while the offertory is being played. And make your commitment back to Jesus. And may he bless you. prayer of dedication. Loving Lord, 
in the miracle of the resurrection, you have met all our needs. We return to your hands gifts with which you have entrusted us, our love, our lives, and our resources. These are our worship offerings, the fruits of our days, and we pray that you will find them suitable, substantial, and sufficient. Even as we recognize anew in Easter's clarifying light that all we can give you can never be enough. O giving God, the history of your people is writ large with your wondrous love. Let today be a day of new miracles. Let today be a day that you conform our hearts in your Son's image. Let today be the day that you inspire us and strengthen us to be people of grace. Let us learn to love without measure, give without expectation, bless without envy, and worship without ceasing. We raise these offerings and pray these things in the name and spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ, who died that we might truly live. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So this is the time we talk about the life we share here as a community. We talk about what's going on amongst us and with our friends and our neighbors and our loved ones. And so let me begin, uh, as we usually do with our prayer list, there's some uh, ads and, and, and things, there's some stuff I really want to share here this morning. But uh, we begin with Sunova Graves and with John Bivens, Jerry Miles, Mary Jo Roy, who we're told is doing a great deal better, Helen Resch. Yvonne Ellingson, she was in the office this week and we chatted for a while, she's doing well. Sean Uphoff, Don Moorhead, Jim Stewart, who's here with us this morning, we talked about that, Michael O'Connor, Ben Dresser, Tony Harris, Tony and Connie really need our prayers this week, let's come around them. Lorene Hoover, Ben Fast, Evelyn Vernon, and some new names to us. Uh, I'm going to give you the name of Kaya Lopez. Kaya is in Portland, and she's a nine-month-old infant. She has been hospitalized all the days of her life. She's been in critical condition since she was born in the midst of the COVID era. And she is the granddaughter of Bob and Jane Allen. So that's the bad side of this, right? She's been in critical condition for all this time. I was told right before worship, though, that the good side of this is that her blood counts have come up to a sufficient level that she gets to come home. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and Bob and Jane will see her today for the first time. How about that? Also this week, Curtis, who is Rita, Rita Applegate's husband, took a fall off a ladder and had a head injury that sounds like it's fairly significant. So let's come around Rita and Curtis and let's be prayerful for them. Uh, in our life uh, here this week, the David Bible Study, I already mentioned this, it returns at 11 o'clock on Wednesday. Together in the Word, our twice-weekly devotional will be out there at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning and Friday morning as well. Um, next Sunday, I want you to know that we're going to talk about what does the world look like after Easter? What did Easter really do to the world around us? And then my last, uh, my last announcement, I guess, for the day, and this is probably the most important thing I've said all morning, bar none. Yes, we will have fellowship after worship today <laughs> over in the Fellowship Center. We can do that again. And Hilltop Hospitality has picked up the charge and they're over there waiting for us. So um, come and join and, uh, and uh, have conversation with your friends and your neighbors. That'll be immediately following worship in the Fellowship Center. So now, would you share with me in this call to a new way of living? This is adapted from Philippians, the second chapter. If then there is any encouragement in Christ or any consolation from love, if there is any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, let us be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Let us do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility let us regard others as better than ourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Whoops, I'm backwards. Sorry. <laughs> Remember. Not a good day for me. I don't know. Remember, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee 
Jesus, every knee should bow. Leader, <laughs> and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. To the glory of God the Father. I have a confession to make. I don't usually use the screen. I usually, I'm old school. I think I'm going back to this. All right. Having done that, would you please stand now and let's share together our closing hymn, Lift High the Cross. Before I give you our benediction, there's a word or two I want to say, a word of thanks, and I think uh, I want to ask for you to express your thanks as well. You've seen that our screens look a little different this morning. There's some other stuff going on here, and we owe a great debt of thanks to John Skaggs, who redesigned the, uh, the visuals, and to Kathy Cole, who you can't see. She's back there right around the corner. Stick your head out there. Come on. No? No? You can see Bonnie. Bonnie, of course, is a, is a regular back. There's Kathy. We have a brand new camera. I think most of you knew that was coming. Kathy worked diligently this week, day after day, hour after hour, to get this set up and to get it running. And as you can see, she's been successful at that. And part of her success is, he was seated right in front of her. She has drafted a, an able uh, staff member in her husband, who is our, our clerk of session, who's been running back and forth. I don't know what they're doing. But at any rate, I think they were highly successful with what they did, and it was hours and hours and hours of work. So let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> at the same time, I want to lift up again Ron Waldo, who is undergoing training in his new job today, who has been with us for, I don't know, eight years or something down here doing all the technology stuff. So um, there's been a handoff this week, and uh, that's what all this has been about. So we're, uh, we've got some new things going on, and we're excited for Ron and his new position. So um, thank you to Ron for all that you've done. And now let me give you our benediction. Let us go forth as followers of Christ, proclaiming the good news, performing deeds of mercy and kindness, and let us demonstrate evidence of Christ's love in all that we do. May grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with us all this day, and forever. Amen. <clears throat>